Hi everyone, welcome to Bite Size Med, where we talk about quick, bite-sized concepts in medicine for study and rapid review. This video is on the fluid exchange in capillaries. Each organ in the body is supplied by an artery. The artery divides a bunch of times to form arterioles. The arterioles then branch to form meta-arterioles and capillaries, which then drain into venules and then veins. At the point of origin of each capillary from the arteriole is a pre-capillary sphincter, which controls the blood flow through the capillary. True capillaries do not have smooth muscle in their wall, versus arterioles which do. What they do have is a layer of endothelial cells and a thin basement membrane. This wall is just about a half micron thick. There are spaces between the endothelial cells called intercellular clefts. Lipid-soluble substances can move across the membrane by simple diffusion, like oxygen and carbon dioxide. But substances that aren't lipid-soluble, but are water-soluble and are small, can go through the intercellular spaces, like sodium and glucose. But there's a size limitation, so larger molecules like plasma proteins cannot pass through. There are exceptions to this, like the hepatic sinusoids, where the spaces are large enough for plasma proteins to pass through. The capillary is surrounded by interstitium, so the two are separated by the capillary membrane. The interstitium is like a gel with collagen and proteoglycans. There's fluid trapped in between, and that's the interstitial fluid. Since protein can't fit through the capillary membrane, the interstitium has lesser protein. The only proteins it has comes from leakage from the capillaries. Fluid and other solutes move between the capillary and the interstitial fluid, and there are forces that either push the fluid through or oppose it. There are four forces that determine which way fluids can move. These are called Starling forces, named after Ernest Starling. There are two hydrostatic pressures, which would be the pressure exerted by the fluid itself on either side. In the capillary, it's PC, and in the interstitial fluid, it's PI. There are two colloid osmotic pressures, or onchotic pressures, which are controlled by proteins. In the capillary, pi C, and the interstitial fluid, pi I. So first, let's look at PC. That's the capillary hydrostatic pressure. It's the pressure exerted by fluid, so it sort of forces fluid to move into the interstitium, encouraging filtration, so let's put a plus sign next to it. The PC can be affected by the changes in the arterial and the venous pressures and resistance, which get transmitted to the capillary. An increase in the pressure increases the PC, while the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, PI, pushes fluid back into the capillary membrane so it's negative. The PI is very low because the fluid is trapped in the gel. The capillary colloid osmotic pressure, pi C, is from plasma proteins. By osmosis, it would pull fluid from the interstitium into the capillary, so we'll put a minus sign next to it. The interstitial colloid osmotic pressure is from proteins in the interstitium. In opposition, it pulls fluid out of the capillary. But since the capillary membrane has pores so small that proteins find it hard to get through, this value is lower, but it's still positive. So if we put this whole thing together, that gives us the net filtration pressure. If this value is positive, it means that there's net filtration of fluid from the capillary to the interstitium. While if it's negative, that means the direction of flow is towards the capillary, which is reabsorption. But there's one more factor, the filtration coefficient, Kf, which includes the number of capillaries, the number and size of pores, etc. All that put together as the hydraulic conductance or the permeability of the capillary membrane. So the rate of filtration will be by this Starling equation, Kf into Pc minus Pi minus of Pi C minus Pi I. Physiologically, the PC at the arterial end is higher than the venous. So there's net filtration at the arterial end and net reabsorption at the venous end. But there's a slight disequilibrium with a little higher filtration, and the extra filtrate gets returned to circulation from the interstitium through the lymphatic vessels. 
So what factors can increase filtration? When PC increases, filtration increases. How does that happen? Increased arterial or venous pressure. Or even if the veins constrict by back pressure, the PC will rise. A reduction of PI, though already PI is quite low. A reduction of the colloid osmotic pressure in the capillary, that's Pi C. Pi C is controlled by the plasma proteins. So if there's low plasma protein concentration, like in something like nephrotic syndrome where there's excessive loss of proteins in the urine, then Pi C is low. An increase in Pi I. So Pi I is by the proteins in the interstitium, which like I said is low. But the lymphatics are the ones that remove proteins from the interstitium. If there's lymphatic damage, then pi I can increase. So ultimately, fluid will move out of the capillary into the interstitium, expanding the fluid spaces, causing edema. Because even the lymphatics can't handle the load. And that's it. That's how Starling forces work for fluid exchange in capillaries. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.